You know what's even better than drinking a delicious International Delight iced coffee? Winning a brand new car to drink it in. Visit internationaldelightcarsweeps.com for rules and enter through November 10th for your chance to win a new car plus a year's supply of iced coffee. No purchase necessary. Years worth of product awarded as product and coupons. Valued at $978.20. Open to legal residents of US and DC. Excluding Alaska, Connecticut, New Jersey, Nevada, Hawaii, Tennessee, and Wisconsin. Who are at least 18 in age of majority. Ends October 10th, 2024. Sponsored by Danone US LLC. For official rules, visit internationaldelightcarsweeps.com. All the dish that's fit to air. Cindy Adams is on 77 WABC. Andy Kahan, he's against, and I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm going to introduce somebody, and I don't know what the hell he does. He is against people who sell murder memorabilia. I don't know what that is. I know about people who sell used jewelry. That's as far as I go. But I'm very eager to speak to Andy. Who are you? Who am I? That's the question that has been going through the universe for years. My name is Andy <laughs> Kahn. I'm, I'm the director of victim services for Crime Stoppers of Houston. I've been a victim advocate for over 30 some odd years. I was actually the first victim advocate in the entire world to be staffed out of a mayor's office out of Houston. So I was in the mayor's office for 18 years. Then I went over to Houston Police Department, and then Crime Stoppers made me in the great godfather fashion an offer I couldn't refuse, and I've been at Crime Stoppers for six years. So I'm like an ombudsman, a troubleshooter, and trust me, a few other choice words that I'm given to advocate on behalf of victims of violent crime. Okay. Like I said in the beginning, you will be patient with me because this is a, a subject on which I have absolutely no knowledge. Where Start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? Where were you raised? Tell me about the I family. Actually, I'm actually a native New Yorker. Yeah. I spent my first eight years in White Plains, New York. Yeah. And then we moved up to the balmy temperature of Rochester, New York. <laughs> where he spent half the year shoveling snow and living in a basement. So I, I grew up in New York and graduated high school in New York. Then I went to college in Boston. And somehow the crime guard gods uh, put me in Houston. And I've been in Houston now for over 40 some odd years. What so did you major in in Houston besides getting the hell out of majored, there? Yeah, I majored in criminal justice and the reason that I made, and I picked Northeastern specifically for one reason. I wouldn't have to take math. So <laughs> kind of like, kind of like, you know, Clint Eastwood, I, I know my limitations. Do you look like Clint that, Eastwood? No, but I sound like. <laughs> okay. That's good I enough. Listen, I'm flexible. I'm flexible. Okay. So, Tell me yeah, about your so, parents before we go in further. So my dad uh, grew up, my mom and dad grew up in Brooklyn. And my dad was actually a teacher in Armok High School. And then he t took a job in Rochester. So he was a teacher. He was an assistant principal at a inner city school. And he taught at juvenile reformatories in the summertime. My mom was a hell of a lady. She worked at Allstate as an underwriter. And they both ended up doing the Seinfeld migration down to Florida, where sadly both of them have passed away. Okay, okay. How did you get from that to whatever it is you're going to have to slowly explain to me you now do? How? What What was there in between? There's some big leap. Well, I was actually a former parole and probation officer. So I worked in the system for about eight years. So I saw how the system works and operates, and I saw things that, quite frankly, just blew me away because I knew in my, just from watching the system, that there were many people who were becoming victims of crime who, quite frankly, shouldn't have been victims of crime because of systematic screw-ups. And we were having a severe prison overcrowding situation in Texas, meaning that Inmates were only doing one month out of every year they were sentenced to. We oh. had a guy that did 13 months on a 15-year sentence for sexual assault, came out, was supposed to go to a halfway house. Of course, he didn't show. Gets pulled over by a police officer on some traffic violation. 
and a shootout ensues. He ends up killing the officer. And I'm looking at the file going, this should have never, ever happened. So I ended up on a little known show called CBS's 48 Hours. Yeah. Exposing the early release problem because they were stupid enough to put out a three page memo. They actually put out a memo to staff indicating how many people had to be paroled every week and every month, no matter what their circumstances were due to the overcrowding. And so I gave that to a 48 hours producer. So the way I phrase it is I exposed early release. They in turn gave me my early release. So <laughs> that kind of set me off. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm okay. I'm a successful early release Okay. Now explain to somebody like me who's, head is full of air, what it is you are doing now. Be patient with me. What are you doing? So I kind of developed a very unique niche amongst victim advocates. I always felt that victims' rights was a product, and you have to market your product, and you have to sell your product. In order to do that, you have to let the public know that you exist. So When I first started in the mayor's office, I developed relationships with both local and national and statewide media because I realized the media would be my most powerful tool and ally and if properly used can be an agent of change. So we started a a great relationship exposing a lot of the glitches and wrongs in the systems. So that was one avenue. I serve on the board of Parents of Murdered Children and surviving family members of homicide. I've been with this group now for over 30 years. They meet every month at Crime Stoppers. I serve on the board of Texas EquiSearch, which does rescues and searches for missing persons. I do an awful lot of legislative work because I'm of the opinion anybody can yell and scream about the injustices of the world. I would much prefer to find a solution and or a remedy. And one way that I, be, that I do this is I get laws passed. So in my tenure now of over 30 some odd years, I've been responsible for over 25 pieces of legislation to enhance victims' rights and public safety. Okay, I know all that now. Now I know all that. Now what I don't know is, what is it you're doing about people selling murder memorabilia? So here's the story. Like I said, I I grew up primarily in Rochester. It was the fall of 1999. I was perusing through a paper in Rochester, and it had a little blurb about a New York serial killer's art privileges rescinded because prison officials discovered he had artwork for sale on eBay. And that, that intrigued me. And I went over to eBay and clunked a search in for serial killers. And items came pouring out. And I'm looking at this going, wait a second. You can't be selling your personalized items through third-party dealers for profit. This can't be legal. You shouldn't be able to rob, rape, and murder and then turn around and make a buck off of it. I was absolutely dumbstruck. Contacted eBay's Public Affairs, who got to know me rather well for the next few years. And he very succinctly put it like this. And he said, you know, Andy, we're not the morality police. If you don't like it, feel free to do something about it. So I took him up on his offer. So I started investigating this industry. I I came up with a cool, catchy word called murderabilia to describe this industry. And I decided I was going to take it on because I'm of the opinion you shouldn't be profiting from crime. I mean, I'm a firm believer in free enterprise and capitalism, but I think you got to draw the line somewhere. And this is where I kind of drew the line. Okay, so what kind of stuff? What are we talking about? So if you ever came into my office in a duffel bag in the corner, I have five different serial killer hair samples. I don't think I'm going into your office, honey. Yeah, go ahead. No, my, as our CEO of Crime Stoppers says, going into Andy Kahn's office is both fascinating and terrifying at the same time. Yeah, okay. I'll go to a hairdresser. I'm not going to visit (laughs) you. Go ahead. I have hair samples. I have artwork. Tell me, tell me, whose hair samples? What have you got? I have Charles Manson's hair that was that was sold in the form of a swastika. What are you talking about? I'm losing my mind. What are you talking about? Well, they take their hair and they ship it out, and then you have people on the outside that operate websites 
like murder auction, true crime auction house, cult collectibles, dark crime collectibles, and so forth. And then they cut deals with a lot of the serial killers and high-profile killers in return for shipping personalized items out. You get a cut of whatever the sale price is. So you have you have clothing that's sold, letters, autographs, hand tracings. I even have somebody's fingernail clippings. Now, just about as bizarro as you can get. I had you name it, as long as it's attached to someone who has name recognition. And like it or not, serial killers and high profile murders in this day and age are well known to the public. Listen, I'm due for a manicure tomorrow. How am I going to know that somebody's not taking my cuticle and selling it for $7,000? It looks like uh, cuticle's a cuticle. How are you going to prove it? Shop Macy's VIP sale going on now. Use your coupon or Macy's card and take an extra 30% off the latest fall trends from designers that rarely go on sale. And save 15% off skincare, makeup, fragrances, and more. Plus, shop fall specials for even more great deals on top brands at Macy's. Savings off regular and already reduced prices. Exclusions apply. Most tax pros leave a message. It's Jane. I'm moving on to a TurboTax expert who beat your price. Adam Devine, tell him how I feel. Hey, tax pro, she's been thinking twice. Just believe TurboTax will beat your price. This is a tax break. Uh. Switch to a TurboTax live expert and we'll beat what you paid your pro last tax season. Make the switch at TurboTax.com slash beat your price. TurboTax full service only. Sign up by 12-20-2024 and file by 4-1-2025. Full details at TurboTax.com slash beat your price. Well, uh, here's here's how I, I get asked that question a lot when I do presentation. How do you know you're getting a real good? Trust me when I say it's a cutthroat industry. There's no love loss between the dealers. And if other dealers find out that dealers are selling fraudulent items, they will out you in a heartbeat. So the fingernail clippings that I have from a California serial killer, they're attached to an index card. And on the index card, it says, I'm just flabbergasted that someone would want to collect my fingernails. I've got no objections as long as they don't end up in the hands of a Haitian voodoo priest. Okay. How do we, I mean, this is ridiculous, but my questions are also as ridiculous as your career. No. Tell me, how do you know that somebody didn't write this crapola? How do you know that? The guy's gone. How do you know it? Well, I'll say this in a tongue-in-cheek fashion. I only deal with reputable dealers, people that are in the industry. And like I said, they'll out you in a heartbeat if they find out you're selling fraudulent items. And also because I started communicating with a lot of the serial killers in itself to find out how this business works. Nobody knew this was existing except for yours truly. So I I decided I'm going to go fishing I sent out letters to 20 serial killers all across the country, was very upfront who I am, what I do. I attached printouts with stuff being sold with their name on it. And I just asked them, are you aware of this? What do you think of this? Are you making any money? Of the 20 letters I sent out, I received 12 responses. What's the price? What's the price of my fingernail? If I was whatever I was, I was. What's the price of two cuticles from my finger? What What's the price of a cuticle? <laughs> Going price for finger nail clippings, you'd be it depends on your notoriety. I mean, Manson items are, went for thousands of dollars. John Wayne Gacy became rich on death row. It's like any other business. If you have name recognition, your stuff can go for hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars. Our what do the people who pricey. buy them do with? this stuff i mean my own manicurist will throw out my own nail what will somebody collecting john gacy's fingernail well like it or not there are groups of people in this world that idolize serial killers and when you think about it in a broad perspective let's take a look at the entertainment industry entertainment industry thrives around one word murder when you think about it who are the books written up? Who are the movies made up? And especially in this day and age, streaming shows are done of true crime. True crime is booming. 
So there's a niche for it. And there's people that, for whatever reasons, you have people who idolize entertainers, athletes. Then again, you have other people that, for whatever reasons, put serial killers on a pedestal, and they want to own a piece of them. And this is one way they do it. What do you collect? What do I collect? Baseball cards. Well, well, that's already another whole program. (laughs) Forget (laughs) it. I'm tired of this. The other thing, too, in my Wait a minute. Wait just a second. I'm not finished. How much for a used boxer for the pants, the drawers of somebody? Clothing is pretty pricey. It can go for hundreds of dollars because that person actually wore the item. You know, the, the, letters, the letters are pretty mundane because letters are a dime a dozen. You can get those pretty reasonable. Artwork can, go, can be pretty pricey. They can go for thousands depending on, depending on who did this. The hair can go for hundreds of dollars. So there, it's, like I said, it's the most bizarre project issue I've ever encountered in my 30-plus years of criminal justice. They have a Jeffrey Dahmer doll serial killer coloring books, true crime comic books. I have serial killer wall calendars in my office. What about Unit. used drawers? Are they used or are they washed? Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's a question I can honestly say I've never been asked. So well, I'm asking. I'll tell you this. You are. <laughs> uh, generally, they're used. So, for example, I have a cross-dressing transvestite serial killer out of, Madeline, out of Maryland by the name of Haddon Clark, I have his used deodorant in my <laughs> office. Okay. There's a Michigan killer who actually sold her panties. So, yes, this stuff is still happening. Okay, I got more questions. What, but I, I know that Texas is the biggest crime unit in the country. At least that's what I've been told. Why is that? Because it's the largest state? What do you mean by biggest crime unit? Well, they say that they have more crime from Texas or more stuff coming out of Texas in this regard than in any other state. Actually, the the state that leads the league in the murderabilia market is California. Texas and Florida are then tied for second. But, like, California has named... Name killers. When you think about California serial killers, you got Manson, you had Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, you have so many others. So we give cool, catchy nicknames to serial killers, right? Yeah. That's how they're known, though. Son of Sam, Killer Clown, Night Stalker, Green River Killer, Happy Face Killer. So we give them all this niche nicknames. The murder billion industry was basically an underground market that in time because of the internet became into mainstream America and all across the world. This is one way serial killers can still feel relevant and satisfy their narcissistic ego because they're still in the public eye. What's the disgusting value of what's his name? Uh, Oh, what's the guy's name? California. The, 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 uh, I can, my brain is, my brain is on hold. The 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 boxer. The boxer. Oh, I mean the he. Well, I'll think of it and I'll call you. I'll think, think of, of it. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What are the prices? What are your prices? Well, because keep in mind, I was I was buying stuff with my own money because I felt kind of queasy about submitting a reimbursement for a serial killer's hair in a government office. So I just kind of kind of kept it to myself, and I learned how to how to bid. I also learned that if I can get other media throughout the country to do stories on local serial killers, they in turn will buy the items. And then when they're finished with their story, I would very politely say, may I have your items because you're no longer going to use them. And so that was another way for me to accumulate items. But, you know, I, I would I would say my collection is, is invaluable because these are things that you can't replace. So when I travel, I'm very careful with the items because the last thing I want is for a suitcase full of murderabilia to be somehow lost or someone else ends up taking my own bag. Not a good look. So what do you do at an airport when the TSA goes through you? 
I'm actually prepared with articles that actually happened when I did a presentation in Canada and I had to cross the country and I was pulled over and I had to show the TSA agent an article showing that, no, I'm the good guy. And then I had to show, no, I didn't buy any of this stuff in Canada. So I am well prepared for that. But it's absolutely hilarious sometimes if they go through your bag. I'll tell you a quick funny story. I was I was doing yeah. a thing with uh, ABC's 2020, and I had to bring the, the murder Billy with me because they needed close-ups of the items, and they asked me to meet them at their studio early in the morning. And I went to their studio, and I asked for the producer, and they said, well, she's not in yet. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm just going to go find a cup of coffee because I don't do mornings well. And I leave the bag in, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the I leave the bag in there, and I go trying to find a <laughs> cup of coffee. And all of a sudden, there's these two cops in a suit. They're screaming at me, sir, 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 did you just drop off a duffel bag in ABC studio and get up and leave? We need you to come back with us right away. <laughs> Right across the street was the Hotel Mayflower where diplomats and all fancy people stay. And I'm, I'm walking back going, this is better than a cup of coffee. And then I'm going, if they <laughs> open that bag, they're going to see hair samples, <laughs> fingernails. <laughs> and I got a world of explaining okay. to do. So I'm very careful. Okay. okay, I just my brain just kicked in again. OJ, OJ, OJ. This pig OJ. What have you got from him? Anything? Well, keep in mind, there's a very sticky thing with O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson wasn't convicted of murder, was he? He was not. Well, he should have been what he should well, have been. Well, he should have been, but by the law, he wasn't. Therefore, anything he could do was fair game. Now, when he was convicted, finally, of the stupid robbery heist he tried to pull in Vegas, then it became an issue. So we care very carefully we're watching to see if he was going to put anything out there. But the problem with OJ was he was already famous before, you know, he turned to his other career ventures as a career violent offender as well. So it, it's it, okay. I, so, I so let us assume, let us assume you're, let us assume you're a nice, normal, everyday person who sells schmatas or silks or something like that. Are you married? Do you have children? What is your life? talking about who the dealers are yeah so your I, life I your who, own life my own life i don't discuss my personal life trust me for obvious reasons oh no, okay I, I, okay I, but i'm certainly I, i'm semi-thrilled <laughs> to be talking with but you i will tell you I, my son I, is a federal I, prosecutor well, listen that's good enough i don't want either of you to visit me it was very, very nice to talk to you, Andy. I've never spoken to someone who does what you do, and I've enjoyed the conversation, and thank you for being pleasant with me. Anytime. So promise me one thing. Okay, you're, not gonna compete, you're not going to compete with me on buying murderabilia. No, you're absolutely, I have your, I have you're your absolutely safe, that, and right? I'm not going to give you any of my drawers either. Okay, right. thank you. Smart answer. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it, Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.